This episode was suggested by my husband, David. If you'd like to make a suggestion, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, and on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. This episode contains discussions of war, possible exploitation, mental illness, and suicide. If these aren't things you want to hear about, this may be a good episode to skip. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. Cricket is the second most popular sport in the world after football, or soccer to our North American creepy community members. As the Cricket World Cup is currently going on, my husband David suggested I do a podcast on the history of cricket. At first, I didn't think there was anything morbid to be found in the history of cricket, but with some encouragement, I dug deeper and came across a very interesting, very tragic incident involving a first-class cricketer on the verge of making a name for himself in Australian cricket. For all those new listeners tuning in because this episode features cricket, welcome. We don't generally touch on sports in this podcast, as we're a dark history podcast, but we've made an exception for this story. I'm pretty new to cricket, so if I get something wrong, please forgive me. For our regular listeners, welcome back. I hope I'm able to explain cricket well enough to pique your interest, and I hope you enjoy another venture into the darker side of history. I also want to say a huge thank you to the Melbourne Cricket Club Library at the Melbourne Cricket Grounds, and especially to librarian David Studham, who helped me to access the hard-to-find materials I needed for this episode. Thank you. Before we get into a story of scandal and murder, I want to give a brief description of the game of cricket and its history. As I said, I'm new to cricket, and I valued an overview of the basics when doing this research, so I wanted to share it with you as well. Cricket is a bat and ball game where two teams attempt to score as many points, known as runs, as possible. Each team is made up of 11 players, and the two teams take it in turns to score runs by hitting balls that are thrown or bowled at them by the opposing team. Two batters or batsmen play at the same time, but only one is bowled to at a time. Both batters stand at either end of a 22-yard long strip of prepared turf called the wicket. The batsmen can score runs for themselves and their team by hitting the ball into an oval field and swapping sides with the other batter. The opposing team bowls the ball overarm at a set of wooden stumps with small wooden bales placed on top of them. This set of stumps and bales are also known as the wicket and sit on either end of the wicket turf. A batsman is out if the bowler hits the wicket that the batsman is defending, or if the ball he bats is caught while he's running. A team needs at least two people batting to continue scoring. Therefore, once ten wickets have been claimed by a bowling side, the batting team's inning is completed, their tally of runs cannot increase, and they are said to be all out. Once the batting team is all out, the teams swap over, and the opposing team gets a turn at bat. Games are played with either one or two innings, and can take anywhere from an afternoon to five days to play, depending on the format of the match. When one inning is played, the team with the highest number of runs wins. In the longer form, two innings per team are played over several days, and the challenge is for one team to stop the other passing their total number of runs. If they fail to do so, they lose. If, at the end of the allotted time, either four or five days, both teams are still playing, the game is drawn. If the other side is all out before they reach their target, they lose. Cricket originates in the southeast of England, sometime around the 16th century. 
The origins of the game are not known, but the most widely accepted theory is that it developed in the early medieval era, in the areas south and southeast of London, known as the North Downs, the South Downs, and the Weald. It was also in this area that the game developed from what was most likely a child's game into a full-fledged sport. Before the laws of cricket were set down in 1744, cricket was played in everyday clothes with no protective gear. Cricketers bowled underarm, like a modern bowling ball, only smaller. They held the bat like a hockey stick, as that is how it was shaped. The modern straight bat wasn't developed until the 1760s, when the bowlers began to pitch the ball instead of rolling it. There were only four deliveries or pitches to an over, which continued until the 19th century. The wicket was two stumps and a single bale until the 1770s. There were two types of matches at this time. Single wicket, which involved one batsman and three to five fielders, and double wicket, which had two batsmen, eleven fielders, and two innings were played for each team. This early form of cricket is known today as pre-modern cricket. Today, cricketers wear a uniform of white, they wear pads, and a double wicket is the standard form of play. As cricket developed in England, it wasn't played anywhere outside of England until the 1700s, when British colonialism spread the game via colonists and soldiers. Cricket arrived in Australia almost as soon as colonization began in 1788. In 1877, the first English cricket tour in Australia occurred, and consisted of two matches against the full Australian eleven, or the eleven best players from the best teams, and this was considered the first inaugural test match series. The golden age of cricket began in 1890, when country and state teams began to form and play matches against one another in both England and Australia. Clubs formed to organize and fund these matches, and cricket became one of the main forms of sporting entertainment in both countries. However, the Golden Age didn't last long thanks to the outbreak of World War I in July of 1914. Most cricketers enlisted in the military, feeling it was the honorable thing to do. Therefore, cricket was put on hold. After World War I ended in November of 1918, play began again but the sport didn't regain the same level of popularity until after World War II. It was during this intermission between world wars that Dr. Claude Tozer, a first-class cricketer and general practitioner who had distinguished himself on the cricket pitch and on the battlefield, began to rise in the ranks of Australian cricket. If he made the New South Wales team, there would be glory, but there would also be downsides, such as Tozer's personal life being made public due to the popularity of the sport and its players. It's for this reason that Tozer knew he had to end his secret relationship with Mrs. Dorothy Mort, a married mother of two who he also happened to be treating for mental illness. If this affair were to get out, the scandal would ruin both of their lives. Claude Tozer was the only child of a bank manager and an heiress who grew up in a small town, upper middle class society. He did well in school, as he was an enthusiastic student, and although shy, he had a flair for sports, especially cricket. At age 15, he made one of the most notable Australian school cricket teams, Shore School, and with this team, won the greater public school title. He was a right-handed batsman and a quiet and calculating player, staying cautious until he evaluated the opposing team's strengths and weaknesses. He was a steady rather than a brilliant batsman. He was later accepted to St. Paul's College at Sydney University to study medicine, which is said to be the Australian equivalent of Oxford or Cambridge in England. He continued playing cricket through his studies, attaining the leading batting stats at the university for 1910-1911, with 794 runs at 72.18. In late February of 1911, he made the state cricket team for New South Wales, batting at number 7, but soon he had to stop playing cricket in order to focus on his studies. The next year, he made one more foray into cricket during his studies and earned the title of Sydney University's most successful club batsman in the 1913-1914 season. Tozer graduated with his medical degree in 1914 and got a job straight away at the Royal Hospital for Women. In 1915, he became engaged to Kathleen Crossman, the daughter of another highly respected family. However, their wedding plans were put on hold when the call came for more Australian soldiers to help end the stalemate at Gallipoli in Turkey. Tozer decided to enlist only five days after becoming engaged. 
He entered the military at the rank of captain due to his senior cadet training while at Shore School and was placed with the Australian Army Medical Corps, First Field Ambulance. He was sent to Gallipoli almost immediately. This was a trial by fire. As a new Army medical officer, he was sent to one of the most brutal campaigns of World War I. This war was being fought using trenches, where soldiers hid from almost constant gunfire. In the trenches, they were safe from bullets, but trapped in all other ways. The men Tozer treated were emaciated by dysentery and trench fever, a flu-like disease caused by body lice, burnt by the hot sun in the summer, and racked with frostbite in the winter. The bloated bodies of the dead that lay in no man's land above the trenches were swept into the trenches by rain. Black flies buzzed around the corpses and landed on the tinned food rations that fed the soldiers, spreading disease. Despite these intensely hard conditions, Tozer treated the wounded, performing little else than emergency surgery, likely for around 20 hours a day. Tozer had a hard war. He was thought dead within weeks of shipping out, and his former university cricket team mourned him before finding out that he had not been killed. He then caught typhoid and spent time recovering in Heliopolis, Egypt, before he was sent back to war, this time to the Western Front. There, a German artillery shell exploded right next to him at Pozere, France, lodging shrapnel in the base of his skull and in his leg. He was out cold for two days, the doctors unsure they could remove the metal without killing him. They decided to leave it where it was, and Tozer spent 12 weeks recovering before he was transferred to England to work at several different hospitals treating wounded soldiers. He suffered from constant headaches as well as other complications from his injury. Despite this, he worked his way into a leadership role at the hospitals. In 1917, a year after he arrived in England, he was promoted to major and sent back to the Western Front. He earned a Distinguished Service Order for continuing to treat the wounded and organizing stretcher bearers under heavy fire during the Battle of Menin Road in Belgium. Back home in Sydney, Tozer's father died in April of that year. Tozer threw himself into his work even more intensely to deal with his father's death but soon succumbed to the same illness he was treating, trench fever. Again, after he recovered, he was sent back to the Western Front. In November of 1918, the war ended. Tozer was sent to England to recover for a short while. While he was there, he went back to his first love, cricket, playing a few matches with other war veterans. This garnered much excitement back home about his return to Australian cricket. Tozer finally did return to Sydney in 1919, still suffering from headaches. He couldn't seem to leave the war behind, as he was constantly reminded of it when he kept finding out that more and more of his cricket teammates had been killed. His fiancée, Kathleen, had waited for him, but now that he was back, she was unsure how to handle his mood swings and unpredictable behavior. It's likely Tozer was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, but this wasn't a known condition at the time. Also, he refused to talk about the war and remained stoic, relying on the work involved in opening up his own medical practice to keep him distracted. Unfortunately, Kathleen became ill and died of septic pneumonia on June 12, 1919, at the age of 26. Tozer again remained stoic, throwing himself into his medical practice and working his way back into the Sydney cricket scene. By January of 1920, he was batting number three for Gordon Cricket Club. It was around this time that a Mr. Harold Mort, of the wealthy T.S. Mort family of industrialists, came to see Dr. Tozer at his medical practice. He sought medical treatment for his wife, Dorothy, who was suffering from an unknown neurosis. Harold Mort described her behavior as erratic, her moods constantly shifting. She didn't sleep, and if she did, she sleepwalked around the house ranting, waking up her children and her husband. She was irritable, and they fought constantly. He described her as hysterical, inconsolable, and sometimes suicidal. Dr. Tozer admitted he was not a specialist in mental illness, what was then called lunacy or insanity, but that he would meet with Mrs. Mort to evaluate her condition, and then make a recommendation for a specialist. Dorothy Woodruff was born on November 2, 1885, to Mackie and Helen Woodruff. She was the oldest of three children who, after moving around Australia for a time, settled with their family in a part of Sydney known as Chatsworth. 
Her father, Mackie, was a fire insurance salesman. Not much else is known about Dorothy's childhood, other than that she did well at school and aspired to become an actress. She met Harold Mort, an heir to the Mort fortune, which was made inventing and selling meat refrigerators while on vacation at the North Shore of Sydney. While they were of very different personalities, Harold being more studious and academic, he was attracted to her vitality. She married Harold Mort on February 20th, 1909. The wedding was a Sydney society affair that was highly reported in the papers as both of their families were well known. Despite her marriage, Mrs. Mort refused to give up her acting lessons, convinced she could become a star. One night in September 1913, when Dorothy Mort was 28, her father, Mackie, became delusional and attempted to murder both her mother and brother with an axe. When he failed, he stripped naked and tried to kill himself for what he had done on the front lawn of their home. He had apparently spoken of how easy it would be to kill someone with an axe for days before the incident. Dorothy, who wasn't there that night, felt guilty for being unable to help her family. On top of this personal tragedy, her father's trial was very public. While Mackie Woodruff was acquitted of the attack on grounds of insanity, he still spent time in prison, as well as an asylum for the insane. If you want to know more about what asylums in Australia were like during this time period, listen to our episode on early Australian lunatic asylums. Upon his release, Mr. Woodruff left for New Zealand to become a farmer, but within a few years, he again began to spiral, and on the evening of December 9, 1919, he threw himself down an empty elevator shaft, killing himself. Dorothy was greatly disturbed by her father's attack on her family and his suicide. His behavior played on her mind for years afterwards. She feared she too would go insane and kill herself. At the same time, she sought the spotlight, auditioning for roles in local film productions and taking acting lessons. After her second child with Harold, she fell into a depression. She worried that her boring existence would cause her to go insane like her father. With most of his savings, Harold bought a mansion, Inglebray, to try and cheer her up, but her depression and mood swings only deepened. Dorothy Mort had a nervous breakdown just before Harold sought Dr. Tozer's help in 1920. At the time, mental illness was not something that was spoken of. Her breakdown embarrassed Harold and his family, and to try and save Mrs. Mort's already tarnished reputation thanks to her father, he and his family did their best to cover it up. Dr. Tozer was the second doctor Harold had approached in secret, as his wife refused to see the first because she said she didn't like him. She would also only be seen by a doctor in their home, as she didn't want people to see her in such a state of distress. Dr. Tozer agreed to a home visit. This decision would ultimately lead to his death. But before we get into the details, let's pause for a word from our sponsors. This podcast is mainly funded by our patrons on Patreon. If you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself? Over 30,000 people download this podcast every month, but only around 60 people are supporting us on Patreon. For a mere dollar an episode, that's $2 a month, you can get ad-free episodes, bonus behind-the-scenes info, give your opinion by answering polls, get updates on previous episode topics, and see photos of my foster cats. For $3 an episode, you get monthly outtake reels. For $5, you get a monthly pub quiz, where I quiz my husband on past episodes. For $10, you get a detailed bibliography of all the sources I've used while researching each episode. And at $20 per episode, you get a bit of miscellaneous morbidity, a short essay on a random morbid topic every month. Last month, we looked at the medicines in Game of Thrones, and previously I've reviewed horror video games and famous morbid pieces of art. All of these rewards aside, your patronage supports the podcast and keeps new episodes coming. I can't keep doing this podcast without you, so go to bit.ly slash morbidpatron, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidpatron, to choose your rewards and support the MCP. You'll have my eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast.
In letters and police reports from after the incident, Mrs. Mort stated that she fell in love with Dr. Tozer almost immediately. He was tall, fit, and made her feel special as he consoled her with promises that she would be restored to full health. He seemed to understand her. Tozer, on the other hand, after this first meeting, told his widowed mother, who he was living with at the time, that he didn't know why God made these neurotic women. Mrs. Mort asked for more home visits, and Dr. Tozer complied. Mort was a well-bred woman with good grooming, money, and fashion sense. Tozer was a rising athlete, a war hero, and a doctor. Despite these accolades, both were also vulnerable. Mrs. Mort due to her own mental illness as well as her father's, and Tozer due to his experiences during the war and the death of his fiance. Within a week of meeting, the two were writing letters to one another. It's unknown if Tozer had fallen for Mrs. Mort, felt that this was the best way to treat her condition, or if he was using her obvious infatuation for his own gains. It's possible he had finally found someone to open up to about his own troubles after years of hiding behind a mask of productivity. Either way, his letters address Mrs. Mort as Dearest Lady, Little Lady, or Lady Diana, and are sympathetic but also seem to seek sympathy. According to the letters, their relationship wasn't physical at first. In one of his letters, Tozer spoke of being unable to remain platonic for much longer, and in another, he compared himself to a sleeping volcano, ready to burst. He said he was never happier than when Mrs. Mort was near him. It's questionable as to how physical their relationship became, if at all. Mrs. Mort referred to Tozer as her lover, and at one point claimed to be pregnant by him, but this was later proven false. She stated in a letter to her mother that she loved and worshipped him to the exclusion of everything else. Whatever the case, Mort was a married woman, and Tozer was in a relationship with one of his patients, a situation that is both highly unethical and inappropriate. During the six months in which Tozer and Mort were having their illicit affair, Tozer was rising quickly to fame in Sydney cricket. He had a prolific season, batting 452 runs in three matches with the Gordon Cricket Club. This earned him selection for the Australian eleven to play against the touring Melbourne Cricket Club. In that match, he batted first and made a pair of half-centuries, or 50 runs over two innings. His performance got him selected to captain the New South Wales team in their match against Queensland on the 1st of January, and to play against England just before Christmas in the Ashes, a renowned annual test series. Tozer turned down the spot playing against England in the Ashes, as he had a lot going on at his medical practice. Part of this was ending things with Mort. The life of a cricketer was quite public, thanks to newspapers and gossip magazines. Tozer knew his relationship with Mort was wrong, and if it got out, it would be devastating to both his practice and his cricket career. In early December, during one of his frequent house calls to Mort, he told her that a doctor should be married and that he planned to propose to another woman. Tozer had invented this other woman as a way of getting out of the relationship with Mort, a way that he hoped she would understand. After he told her, she seemed to be in shock, so he offered to remain friends and promised to meet with her one more time before Christmas. She agreed. However, Tozer ended up postponing their meeting several times due to a full schedule at the medical practice. When Harold Mort called to say that his wife was very unwell and had been for weeks, Tozer couldn't put off the meeting any longer. On December 21st, Tozer arrived at Inglebray around 11 a.m. Mrs. Mort's paid companion and housekeeper, Florence Fizel, greeted him at the door and told him Mrs. Mort was waiting in her bedroom. Fizel noted that Dr. Tozer didn't look well himself as she walked him to the bedroom. She retreated to the back of the house, either to work or to keep an eye on the children who were out back playing by the creek. Around 20 minutes later, she heard the sound of a gunshot, and then another, and another. She found Mort's bedroom door ajar and the room empty. When she tried to open the drawing room door across the hall, she found it locked. From within the room came Mrs. Mort's voice, assuring her all was well. Terrified, Fizel ran next door to telephone Mr. Mort. Either the phone was not working or she was unable to reach him. Unsure what to do, she pleaded with Mrs. Mort to open the door, but was met with no response. Some time later, another shot rang through the house. Fizel fainted, only to be revived later by the Mort children. 
Both the drawing room and the bedroom doors were now locked. It seemed Mrs. Mort had moved back into her bedroom. Poppy, the oldest child, tried to coax her mother out of the room, but to no avail. Mort finally asked for a glass of ice water to be left by her door. This was done, but when she asked a second time, Fizelle forced the door open and found Mrs. Mort covered in blood and in a haze of laudanum poisoning. This time, Fizelle called the police and the local doctor, who both arrived at the house around 9 p.m. The doctor proceeded to empty Mrs. Mort's stomach of the laudanum, either by pump or emetic, a drug that makes you vomit. He saw that she was wounded in her left breast. When the police arrived, they searched the house, forcing open the door to the drawing room. Inside, they found Tozer, dead on the couch, a Colt revolver in his lap. There was blood everywhere, including on a kimono that Mrs. Mort had been wearing when Tozer arrived. Four bullet shells lay on the ground next to a half-smoked cigarette and a half-written prescription. Around 11 p.m., Mr. Mort arrived home, confused as to why his home was crawling with police officers, as well as several members of the press. Mrs. Mort was finally removed from the house and taken to the North Shore Hospital late that night. She was placed under armed guard while she recovered, as at that point it wasn't clear who had shot her and Tozer. What occurred in the drawing room of Inglebray was revealed shortly after Mrs. Mort was brought to the hospital. She pulled a police officer to her bedside and confessed to all that I'm about to describe. As she spoke to the police, it was noted that she seemed rational, but incredibly infatuated. She stated that she had decided that if she couldn't have Tozer, no one could. As soon as Tozer had left her home after their previous meeting, Dorothy Mort had gone into town, purchased a Colt revolver and a large bottle of laudanum, which, if you remember from our Plants That Kill episode, is a tincture of opium, alcohol, and water, a sedative in small doses, but very poisonous in larger ones. When Tozer finally set a time for the meeting, she hid the revolver either in her dress or behind the curtain in the drawing room. As she entered the room, she gave Tozer a picture of herself with a message on the back suggesting she was pregnant. As he read it, she shot him in the back of the head. Unsure if he was dead, she then shot him in the temple and the chest. She then tried to shoot herself, drinking the laudanum and taking aim at her own chest. The bullet, however, only went through her left breast. She began to feel extreme remorse. She tore up the picture she had given Tozer and lay with her head in his lap for hours before moving across the hall to her bedroom and locking both doors behind her. She lay on her bed in an anguished stupor until she became thirsty and called to Fizel for water. Her story was soon confirmed by the discovery of the letters Tozer had written to her during a thorough search of the house the next day, as well as two she had written just before the incident, one to her own mother and one to Tozer's, describing the affair, her love for Tozer, and her intention to end her life. The crime scene was photographed, and Tozer's body was removed from the house nearly 18 hours after he was killed. He was buried the next day at Waverly Cemetery, after what must have been a hasty autopsy. Mrs. Mort was charged with murder. Her trial was set for March of 1921, and it became the event of the year. Crowds of people and press filled the public galleries of the courthouse and surrounded the outside, hoping to catch a glimpse of this upper-class female murderer. The defense strategy of her lawyers was to plea for acquittal due to insanity. The letters she and Tozer had written to one another were used as evidence and then published in the newspapers. Tozer was accused of being a seducer, a cad with no qualms about exploiting Mrs. Mort's infatuation. Mrs. Mort was made out to be a frail, hysterical housewife, a victim of seduction. The defense got the result they were hoping for. Mrs. Mort was acquitted on grounds of insanity. However, she was still sentenced to be held at an asylum at the governor's pleasure, meaning until she was well again. As the asylums of Sydney were overcrowded, Mort was instead sent to Long Bay Penitentiary, which had a women's wing, occupied by only three other prisoners. There she stayed for nine years, a model prisoner living in relative luxury thanks to the arrangements her husband and his wealthy family were able to make. During her incarceration, her husband petitioned for her freedom and Tozer's mother tried to clear his name, saying that he may have made a mistake, but he was not a seducer. 
Rumors started that it was Mrs. Mort who had seduced Tozer, that she was a delusional siren. Upon her release, Mrs. Mort's doctors stated that she had never seemed insane or hysterical to them. She went quietly back to her family and never had another incident as far as anyone knows. Dorothy Mort died peacefully in 1966 at the age of 81. As for Tozer's mother, she never stopped trying to clear his name, but without a clear view of his side of the story, there's no way to say one way or the other what really transpired between Claude Tozer and Dorothy Mort. If you'd like to know more about this case, Suzanne Falconer's book, Mrs. Mort's Madness, is a good place to start. She admits to filling in parts of the story that aren't known with assumptions, but the rest is drawn directly from court records and the letters of Tozer and Mort. Another good book, if you can find it, is Bold by a Bullet by Greg Grodin. This one focuses more on Tozer and his life before the murder, and also draws on court records and other facts surrounding the incident. However, it's very hard to find, and there are no digital copies. The story of the murder of Claude Tozer is tragic. Who is to blame? Who manipulated who? Or is no one to blame? Were Tozer and Mort just two people who became wrapped up in their loneliness and desire as a way to escape from their real lives? The truth has been lost to history. There is no way to know for sure, which is why this dark piece of history brings out the curiosity in us. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media. And please, please, please give us a rating on iTunes. Your shares and ratings help us reach new listeners and expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who commented, suggested topics, shared MCP posts, liked or followed the MCP on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and gave us ratings on iTunes. People like Russell, Carmel, Michelle, Tori, Louise, Nicholas, Christy, Sherry, Wonder Rage, Pontifax Podcast, Lydia, JD, Allison, and Roger, Mina, Jasperi, Amber J, Libisaurus Rex, Amber B, and Colette all have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes and news articles, and share your own creepy stories and cute pet pictures. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you really like the MCP, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You can also give one-time donations by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the donate button. On our website, you can also find links to all our social media and sponsors, and other ways to contact us. If you'd rather contact us by mail, this address is also listed on the website. Another way to help the show is by going to our Amazon wishlist at bit.ly slash morbidwishlist. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.